All right, welcome tonight to Shop Night Live. I'm glad to have you here. It's been a rainy day, but we've got a nice warm shop to be in tonight. And you know what? Tonight I'm not going to do a lot of work. <laughs> I don't feel like it. No, actually, I, I've been kind of, I don't know what is going on. I did work today, but... I was kind of nostalgic, you know, thinking about how I got into this and and what it all means. What it all means. Why do I do this? Why do you even care to watch this? It's it's just blows my mind, you know, like that there's um there's just this seed of kind of energy and creativity and enjoyment that we get out of making things so the kind of the um, the point of where this discussion goes sometimes and I noticed it from being around my friends in the New Hampshire Furniture Masters group um, that by the way if you want to check out some really awesome furniture um, go on furnituremasters.org and you'll see the group that uh, New Hampshire furniture makers that I've been part of for almost 25 years. Just amazing workmanship on there and friends. And you can click and see a lot of great work on that website. But I mentioned that because I, when I got together with those guys at first after we moved up from North Carolina and I joined the group, I noticed that. You know, I'd always called my workspace a shop. But a number of the other makers in the group called their workspace a studio. And I'm like, studio? <laughs> it's not a studio. Like I always thought of a studio where, you know, you went to get your picture taken or where an artist worked in the north exposure windows and created magnificent masterpieces, you know, but, but there are a lot of people who've called their place a studio. So what about you? What do you call your space? You always hear me re uh, refer to this space as a shop. I welcome you to the shop. And uh, I think that's because I like kind of the, I associate more with the blue collarness of this life. Um, you know, I grew up in a blue-collar city, Lowell, Mass., just, um, you know, a, a kind of a rough town in some ways, but in other ways it was normalized to me that it was, it was a great place to grow up. It was, but it was, I was surrounded by this blue-collar ethic to work, and it was honest to get it done and to, to re be real, be... Don't be a phony. Make things of value. Make something of value of yourself. Don't be a pretender. So I think that's part of the message I got. And I, one of the things I love about furniture making is that it's real. And it's, you can't fake it. You know, you finish the piece and you've got an object there. It's not just, I didn't just say a bunch of things in the moment and try to, convince you of something. I, I made something and there it is. Take it for what it's worth. So that part I relate to and one of my kind of early idols in the woodworking world was Sam Maloof. And he was asked, you know, what does he consider himself? An artist or and as you see on the title of his book, Sam Maloof Woodworker, that's because that's how he responded. He said, I'm a woodworker. And I relate to that guy, you know, not for the putting myself on the par of him as a, as a craftsman, but I relate to that sentiment, that earthy kind of woodworker. Now, I think Sam was much more than a woodworker, and I want you to consider that so are you. 
if you're watching this, that so are you. And it's inside of you to be in a studio as much as a workshop. So my argument is that your space, your space is both. It's a workshop where, yeah, you get, you got to grind it out. You got to have that kind of hard edge to get through things sometimes that aren't interesting. You know, it's like you're sanding something or you're, you're doing something that's not all that, uh, you know, impressive. But also, it's a studio because I honestly, I started reading this book, and this has maybe put me in this mindset. Um, this was recommended to me like a year ago by someone I respect, and I, I only started reading it in the, last, in the last week. I guess everybody's trying to find a good book to read these days, right? That's going around. Well, if you are looking for a, a book that will and you feel like there might be something inside of you that needs to come out. And maybe this coming into woodworking and your sudden interest in this medium is telling you something. And you should respond to it. Um, this is a great book to help bring that out. I can already feel it, you know, from the, from the first chapter. So... I would highly recommend this. I'm probably going to refer to it because it is rekindling my early feelings and why I chose to take on this craft and dive in fully to it. So um, I do want to talk about that as we go along. <laughs> but um, You should probably know there's a lot of conversation about what... Certain shops look like basements, garages. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> workshop, shop, you know, dust bowl. Yeah. <laughs> well, when I said, what do you call your space? Yes, so there's a lot of... <laughs> the dungeon. Yeah, I know. I've had a lot of unimpressive workshops. The camera lady knows. <laughs> the first one was in a basement of a house that was built in 1710. It was Buckman Tavern in Lexington, Mass. We actually lived in this historic monument of a house where the Minutemen gathered the night before the Battle of Lexington, the first battle of the American Revolution. We were resident managers in there for the first year, first four years we were married. And I had a little shop set up in this basement where the stones, you know, and it was dirt in the area. And I... I refinished a few pieces down there. I don't know if anyone knew that, but I was working, doing it back then too. So um, that wasn't pretty. And then in North Carolina, you know, a little garage and all that. But I'm not talking about the beauty and, you know, the impressiveness of your space. I think it can almost be like a special kind of, almost like a holy kind of place for you to express your highest work. So I, I just want you to think about that because I, another thing that I was thinking about the other day was I was looking through some various books, I forget, titles online, and I saw this title that when I first read it before looking close to it, I thought it was about woodworking. And I said, oh my gosh, that is a genius title. That really says what, what's at the core of, of the meaning of it for me. And it turned out it was a book about American Sign Language, <laughs> which the camera lady would like, because she loves American Sign Language as well. But the name of the book was talking with your hands, listening with your eyes. And there were hands on the front. So talking with your hands, listening with your eyes. And what's ironic about this is when I first started working with Pug Moore in North Carolina, the third guy in the shop was Billy Frazier. And he had graduated from the deaf school in, in North Carolina in 
Pug's father had hired him like 40 years earlier. So Billy could not speak and could not hear, but he was a sign language master. So I learned some sign language and got to talk to him that way. But at the same time, I was having these conversations with Pug about the masterpieces of, of furniture making, the 18th century period. That's what he was into, recreating 18th century furniture. And we would thumb through these great books. And I was always curious with him, like, Pug, what's, what's the difference between the pieces of furniture that get to the museums, the ones that are in there, and the ones that never get recognized. You know, it's almost like, why is this a hit song or, you know, a real masterpiece hanging in the Louvre? And why is this one, you know, sold for, you know, it's respectable, but it's not great. It's just good. And so here we were, and he, he started showing me and different books we'd go through, and, it, and I'd just hear his reaction. You know, he'd say, oh, that's, that's beautiful. Or, so we shared this common love for just taking it in. And it's almost like the involuntary response you have when you see something beautiful or breathtaking. It's, it's like, like laughter is involuntary. It's almost like that, like you have this like, oh my gosh, that, that's really spectacular. And I would try to pull it out of him, like, why do you think that? And we would talk about proportions. You know, a lot of things I try to articulate in some ways as we go through projects, you know, use of materials, details, the, the beauty of the wood, the figure, the carving, whatever it is. But it got to me thinking, you know, like, um, here we were, talking about the beauty of the furniture and in a way um, listening with our eyes. There was a, a great quote, um, I forget the guy's name, a quote that I liked anyway. He was actually referring to architecture and he said, great architecture is like frozen music. And I thought, man, that's so perfect for furniture because furniture is like miniature architecture. You know, you have the freedom to design, put the details, proportions, and it can be beautiful in its form, its ornament, its detail, all of that. And, but he was speaking in that way. He was speaking that of listening with your eyes. And at the same time, we try to speak with our hands. It's odd because what comes out of our hands says something. You know, it's like, it it's, can be warm. It can be loving. It can be, you know, just a statement of, of how, you, how you handle that, that detail or softening that edge or undercutting that edge. You know, we're going to talk more about those kinds of things. So when I'm using that language, I'm thinking of it, you know, as we go through this table project, which we'll pick up on Saturday, Saturday morning at 10, we're going to be um, picking up our shaker end table with a drawer. And I try to always bring out those little elements of the conversations I had with Pug about just listening with your eyes, trying to see that almost musical quality of a beautiful piece of furniture and a, the note of a great detail, you know. So I want to encourage you to, to uh, look at furniture that way. But um, I also, I wanted to talk to you just about, with this, this same vein, some of the most influential makers and books that, you know, some of these that I had conversations with Pug about, I'm going to show you a couple of those in a minute. Um, but I've already shown you the Sam Malouf. But this book here, James Krenoff's Cabinet Maker's Notebook, this was written in the 80s, I believe. 
when he was in his 60s, James Cranoff, and I think he moved to 90. Um, but he was in he was Sweden. He came up and, and then he moved to the United States out to, uh, I think it was Fort Bragg, California, and started, and started teaching out there. And um, gosh, College of the Redwoods is where he started teaching. But um, a lot of, a number of the furniture masters have gone there. Tim Coleman, who's an amazing furniture maker, you can clearly see some of the early influence of James Krenoff on his work. But this book is probably responsible for more guys in my generation and later getting into woodworking like this. Because he, he has these gorgeous pictures and then he writes he writes so provocatively of like the, the nuances and the little things about it that, that are just really captivating. The subtleties about what's great and appealing and connecting about this craft. And the, it's a really easy read because he's broken it up into sections and they're almost like little blogs. So this is a great book if you want to find that or just connect more deeply to what it is probably you're already feeling about the craft. So I'm um, not showing you pictures, but there's some great, they're all mostly black and white in here. But I also want you to see something I just noticed. This is crazy because I've looked at this cover. I started to look, reading this book in the 80s, you know, the mid, mid 80s. I, I think we're in Buckman Tavern. When, uh, yeah, I picked this up at the library across the street, the Cary Memorial Library. And this, I looked more closely. I don't know, can you see this? Huh? If you can zoom in. Can you see those marking lines on there? Um, I don't think so. Okay. Is that better? Yeah, hold you hold still. Okay. I'll um, try to maneuver. So he's got dovetails there, and we... I don't know, we're going to be using our marking gauge pretty soon. But if you can tell, you look really close. There's two lifelines there. Two knife lines. So it's almost like it has to be a mistake. <laughs> you know, you don't make two knife cuts to show the depth of those pins. But there it is, right on the very cover of the book. So this should be an encouragement to all of us <laughs> that one of the great masters <laughs> who, uh, who showed, who led the way to so many people had this little thing and it's right on the cover. But um, everything else is so, so inviting to the touch. Like he was really a master at softening the edge and making these little finger holds. This is a little lap, like a, a lap desk, I believe. And that lid, you just lift it up. It's just... Something about the warmth and beauty of his work is just so magnetic. So that's a great book to check out if you want to see it, if you want to get you, caught up. You can mention all the, the books that Tom is showing you. We've put links to in the description. Yeah, and this is just a... Uh, interest. We don't have any reason to right. want you to buy if, them, just if you're interested. I'm just going through them. If you're in, into it, it makes it easy to find them. This is just a small sampling <laughs> of what came out of the office, but this one I really like a lot too. And uh, this is from of George Nakashima. He was another of the studio furniture makers. Uh, so Sam Maloof, James Krenoff, and George Nakashima were some of the best known studio furniture makers in the mid 1900s uh, to the later part. So, but he's he seems to have originated the ubiquitous slab top tables you see everywhere now. He didn't use any epoxy resin, but he did those butterfly inlays. Um, but he's, he's almost spiritual about his reverence for wood and his desire to, you know, use the piece for its maximum 
uh, expression. So he often would come up to these slabs, which he stored vertically in these massive barn he had. And he wrote a book called The Soul of a Tree. And these, he had these great slabs, a lot, mostly of, most of his known work is in walnut. So look at that. I mean, just gorgeous stuff. So this is a great book just to see his history and how he worked. And anyway, he's one of the, the masters. So those three are very influential, and I, I paid a lot of attention to them. I didn't really get into the slab table as much. <coughs> but those are good reference if you like. Check them out. Another book is this one. This is one of the first woodworking books I got. And it was in the, this was in the 80s. I think you gave this to me. Yes, the camera lady gave this to me <laughs> when these dreams of diving in full was stirring. And uh, I, I went through this as deeply as I could at the time, but I wasn't, um, I didn't have a shop. And then I went and spent our time in North Carolina. And I revisited this book probably like 15, 20 years later after having absorbed a lot, and went through and I saw that, thought, gosh, this is an amazing resource for the time. It's, it's packed with a lot of great information in a lot of areas of furniture making. The materials, the, all kinds of wood are described, uh, how wood is sawn and veneer, uh, dimensions of chairs, and uh, it's crazy. But I didn't ever realize it. There's some of it's a little outdated um, because the drills, for instance, <laughs> this was like cordless drills had just come in. So uh, yeah, not like not like now. But anyway, that's a cool resource if you're into it. But these two books, these were some of the most enjoyed ones I had with Pug. There was a whole stack of them. We went through a lot at break time and when we would have our Coca-Cola. Um, <laughs> that was his thing. But one of the books that helped me a lot to understand 18th century furniture is this one. Actually, the one, this is my more recent copy. He had the original copy by Israel Sack called, I think it was called Good, Better, Best, uh, The Fine Points of Furniture. And it was Israel Sack. Um, an antique dealer in New York City. And he, he decided to create a book that took a compilation of some of the best pieces that he had come past in his antique dealing. And some would, like I was having those conversations with Puck, some were considered okay, then there was better, and then there was the best. And he would write a little piece on, well, here's one that's better about, you know, this certain mahogany chair and what was good about it. And then you could see as he describes it, almost like an artist trying to help you see the intent of the master on the painting or notice this. This is what separates this from all the contemporary examples. Uh, he would do that with chairs. He did it with upholstered chairs, chests, and talked about all these little nuances. And while you're reading this and making those comparisons, and I'd often do it as a reference book. You know, I wouldn't read it all the way through, but when I'm thinking about chests of drawers, I would go and look at a variety of chests of drawers and read about them and then chairs and so on. But then his son, Israel's, I mean, um, Albert Sack, republished the book and added another category, a couple categories. He had, he just had, I think he still had the good, the best and the better. He had better, best, superior, and masterpiece. And some he had American masterpiece and others were, I think he put, maybe he put an English masterpiece here and there. So, you know, when it came time to build one of these, if I had somebody asking about a certain style table or something, you go to the book and, of 
course, if you're going to reproduce one, are you going to do the one that's better? Or maybe the masterpiece. So I was always trying to reproduce masterpieces, you know, through the, the time I had chances with, with people ordering pieces. So this is a wonderful resource. You learned a lot about the periods, um, the makers, and it's just a great little easy read and it, little descriptions that indicate the subtleties that separated the good, the bad, and the ugly. <laughs> All right. Um, now this book, this is probably the warmest one. I almost, you know, I have such good memories about going through this book with, with Pug. I actually got his daughters after he passed away. His daughters were so kind, they gave me a stack of those books that we had gone through. So it gets me choked up thinking about it. But we, um, we went through this book a lot. This was Joseph Downs, and he was, uh, he, categor he cataloged the pieces, the, the Queen Anne and Chippendale period in the DuPont Museum collection, or Henry, Henry Francis DuPont collection in Winotour. Um, I'm thinking Winotour, Delaware. Yeah, I'm sick of Maryland. It's not Maryland. So Winotour in Delaware. And it is an amazing, beautiful, great stop to visit. If you're ever interested in antique furniture of that period, it's an amazing house. You can go through and have all these period rooms decorated with that furniture. And then right down the road is Linwood Gardens, which is an unbelievable, what do, what do they call that kind of place? Not an arboretum. Arbore oh, I don't know. Is it an arboretum? Maybe Beyond it is. that, I don't know. Yeah, maybe it is. <laughs> What's an arboretum? It's, I guess it's all plants and... Trees? I don't even know. <laughs> it's a Tree. place where they have lots of Arbor is tree. growing yeah. things. How about that? Someone knows. Linwood Gardens. What do they call that place? I don't know. It's just, uh, they have an unbelievable assortment of flowers and gardens and... It's breathtaking. But anyway, this book, we, we reproduced a lot of Queen Anne and uh, Chippendale furniture. But this is where I learned so much about, look at how worn out this is. Oh, and in the front, look at this, Pug's writing there. Property of P.A. Moore, Rocky Mount, North Carolina. So, uh, and there's the address stamp, 2800 Sunset Ave. If you go there today, you can order a Sonic Burger. <laughs> <laughs> can you believe that? It is. It's a Sonic Burger. So sad, but things changed. Um, but then we've got these chairs and upholstered seating, chess. And man, he made a lot of these chairs. Like some of the patterns I have, he even refers to He'll just say Downs 79, you know, because they're all numbered. And so I could go to these pages with some of the patterns that he also gave me and find them referenced. Longwood there. Gardens, folks are saying. Oh, did I say Linwood Gardens? Linwood, yeah. yeah, Longwood Gardens. Sorry about that. Yeah, thank you. What do they call it? What do they call that place? I don't know. Yeah, that's an awesome place. Uh, just a couple others, uh, and I'll go through these more quickly. This is an awesome reference of the collection in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And whenever you get one of these collection books that are from a museum or like just a, a whole collection, these are all, some of them are museums and some of them are just compilations done by an author. I highly recommend reading the preface and, or the introduction the preface and the introduction, okay? But mainly, mainly the introduction because you learn more about furniture history in there than, um, it, and there's they're relatively short articles, but it's, you'll get a lot of the grasp of the periods of furniture and understand a lot of the language. And you won't have to read an entire book because that's how they introduce like everything that's about to come after. And, and encapsulate it, you know, trying to wrap it in meaning and say, this is what's 
about you're about to see. So that's really valuable to look at. I'm going to look at that last. This is a wonderful book that I was given by Joan. Joan, if you're watching, I won't say your last name, but thank you so much for this. Mm. I, she gave this to me as a gift after taking, I think it was the Shaker End Table with a drawer class back in 2005 or 2000, because I got it in 2006, so maybe it was 2006. And it's mo the most beautiful inscription that I read in it. If I'm ever feeling self-doubt about being a teacher, this is the most beautiful <laughs> inscription. So I really appreciate that, Joan. Um, but I have loved this book. It is a great survey of furniture history. If you want to get through and get a, an idea, it's really wonderful resource. And you, as you go through, you'll, it's broken up in all these different periods. So of course you have some very elaborate styles, but then, and then it breaks it up from regions. So in France and some Germany empire furniture, federal furniture back here in the US, you know, just gorgeous examples. And then it gets all the way up through contemporary, even Chinese furniture. This is a great coffee table book. Um, and then Art Nouveau, really nice work here. And then, and then gets into the Art Deco, I believe. So what, oh, and then Craftsman's Furniture, beginning over with uh, Macintosh in England and Scotland. Wow, it's just, it's such a good resource. <laughs> Don't get lost in there. I'm sorry. <laughs> hey, what's the name of the book that you were just looking at just before that? Steve's this, asking. This one? I think so. Uh, this is the... Um, Winator? Ameri no, the American Furniture in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Okay. So this one, um, this, by the way, I wanted to show you, I got to reproduce this piece, this chest of drawers, Newport, Rhode Island piece. John Townsend. Some of you may have heard me say that before, but this is the one in their collection that I got to measure, photograph, uh, make little tracings here and there discreetly, you know, um, so I could reproduce this again. But someday we'll, I'll reveal you some of the subtleties that made that. That is in the masterpiece category, no doubt. And then lastly, um, I want to show you couple this is a these books are great for measured drawings so sometimes you don't know where to begin you know you don't have a leg you don't know the thickness of the leg if you see great pieces but these these books let me let me, let me just show you there's a little table um, so you'll have chairs but you'll get you know measured drawings of what's going on here you know doesn't help as much with curves so like that's why I like to to have full-size drawings when you're rendering a curve and making patterns out of it you can get the actual full-size drawing thank you very much those of you who are now building the dining chair that was just uh, that is in the current article the magazine issue of fine woodworking um, yeah, it's that chair over there on the bench. But that's where it's really good to have the full-size drawing because you can directly render the curvature and the layback angle of that back leg. That's probably the hardest thing. Once you get that, you're really sailing. You know, you can really get going. If it's a Chippendale chair, you'll have more curves and lines and all that to do. But uh, anyway, this is a nice reference book. Again, you have really beautiful summaries of the pieces and the period and what made them great. There's a Duncan Fife table, chests of drawers. You know, you get, I get lost in these books, you know, just appreciating all the... You don't really know how to attach to it at first, but once you read some of these overviews, it starts to make sense and you go, oh, okay, this plugs in 
here in history, and this is why, how this other style evolved out of that or because of what was going on in the time in history. Uh, the designs reflected the moods and uh, the cultural directions at that time in that, in that part of the world. So here's another measure drawing book. And then we get into Shaker. I did put like two or three, I think there's three different Shaker books referenced in there that some of them are measure drawings. This is not, there's a couple other really good ones in there in the notes. Uh, but this is a great one, the John Shea book. You'll, you get a little background in the introduction again to Shaker Furniture. And then you can see all kinds of nice examples and some of how to make it and some are measured. And I did also put in the, in the notes several measured drawing books that have really good information. And then there's the Craftsman period, which I've only in recent years gotten into and more for a teaching tool. So a rocking chair and that dining chair, those were just, like that dining chair was totally informed and came out of my experience from making Chippendale chairs. Like that back leg has a Chippendale root, but it was simplified and has more of the craftsman period ideals on it. So once it's almost like if you learn 18th century furniture, it's like you've studied classical music. You've listened to a lot of classical music. So you can adapt that and those principles you learn there are so useful in, in other, other worlds of furniture making. But I would just start somewhere and Shaker Furniture is a great place to start. Um, let me just show you guys, by the way, some of you have seen it. Thank you also for all of you who are building along the Shaker table. Here's the full-size drawing that quite a few of you, I know we're, we've got a lot more orders to get out tomorrow, and um, they are on their way. They're coming soon enough, but uh, we really appreciate you building that along with us. I'm loving doing that, that class, and I can't wait to pull the name of who's going to win the table. But I just want to talk about a solid piece, at least one, I, not just all book knowledge. So I want to just show you this example of a, uh, a Duncan Fife style chair. And this is a really amazing chair. I've shown it to some of you, I think. But I first, when I had to recreate these chairs, this was the first, this was the first chair I helped Pug with in his shop in like 1990, right? So, and he had to make a set of them. And, but then I made my own later on. I, I actually made this version as a, um, a potential project for a client. But I love having this because I can show some of the genius of the structure here. Now, I'm not going to get into all this, but this is a mortise and tenon chair. A um, lot of subtlety in the way it's like an inch and a quarter there. It goes back to an inch and then up to seven eighths. All these little tapers have this nice kind of uh, refinement throughout. So I showed you the other day that what a difference a tapered leg makes on a shaker table. You know, standing the one that was just square next to the tapered leg one, you can really see, oh my gosh, just that little tapering adds this refined beauty to that thing that is so simple. Well, this chair, with all its curves, is also loaded with a lot of very subtle tapers. You know, this going from an inch here up to seven eighths, as I recall, and then out to an inch and a quarter, and then back down to seven eighths or three quarters back here. Even the back legs are slightly tapered. Oh no, those say, yeah, they do, slightly taper. So there's a lot going on here. And then these, this is what I really want to show you though. Look at what connects this chair. The entire side is a one piece assembly. So you've got a mortise and tenon here, 
mortise and tenon here. And that, that side is one flat plane. And then it's these cross pieces. These seat rails and the back splat and the crest rail are connecting them together, those two fixed sides. So you've got all these mortise and tenons going into the sides as well. But what I want you to notice, and this was copied off of a chair made in 1800. So the construction of this is identical. We had one of the old chairs in the shop. So we were able to see the joinery, but this, notice how thin this front rail is. I mean, it's usually we've got the rail up on edge with a nice big tenon going in there. And the rails on chairs are usually close to three inches high. So you have a good two and a half inch tenon. In this case, the rail is not even an inch and a half. It looks like an inch and seven sixteenths. And that's it. That's the thin profile they wanted with this chair. It really works nicely with the proportions of everything else. Try to imagine if this was a big wide thing. It wouldn't feel the same. And in the back, it's the exact same. But I just want to knock this apart. Is that cherry, Tom? This is mahogany, genuine. The good stuff that it's hard to find now. Uh, these, mostly these were made in mahogany in the period. But check this out. I don't, this is crazy complica complex, but what I really want to show you is this detail. Because if you've been a part of the, of the shaker table class, you've heard me talk about the virtues of the twin tenon. And look at, look at how this is constructed. That back rail and that front rail have both twin tenons. And these chairs are really stout and strong. Now, it's very thin to, vertically, but look how deep it is. It was a nice wide piece. And this is the way the original was built as well. They used the premium primary um, mahogany on the front, laminated on the front. And behind that is, it's a very tight grained oak, yeah, white oak. So we've got that laminated onto the interior. So you've got this white oak rail with the mahogany front. It's the structural core of the seat holding this together. So two very nice twin tenons right in there. And that's really the same joint as we employed when we had this very thin, delicate drawer divider on our table. So you can see we're using the same style divider. So when you have a very narrow uh, element like that, it's best to break up the tenons in this way rather than you wouldn't flip the tenon on its side like that because then you'd have a weaker structure. It would um, be cutting across the leg and it would also, you'd be gluing into end grain here and here and side grain on the tenon. So I just wanted you to see that. That's a cool little look at the bones of a beautiful why, why the Duncan Fife chair. Uh, the difference, it's both for strength and it's also for economy. So you would save not using the more expensive uh, genuine mahogany on the whole rail, like a big fat chunk. But it's also utilizing the strength of the oak uh, as well. Now, John asked a question a little while ago, and I held off until a better time. Um, he's considering tapering the legs on the dining chair, your dining chair? Like, I don't mean to say yours, but the Craftsman one? Yes. How do you, do you think that would work? Absolutely, yeah, you can taper the legs. Um, I've made chairs like that. In fact, look up here. <laughs> Here's a chair that's almost similar in style. It's a more contemporary version, but that has a tapered leg and actually a uh, ebony veneered cuff around the bottom of the foot. Um, it's going to make it look lighter. I intentionally went with the square leg on that Craftsman dining chair because it's not, even though it's an inch and, a, inch and five eighths square leg, 
it's not actually as visually heavy as other Chippendale chairs. A lot of the Chippendale chairs we made that had square legs were inch and three quarters. And then they would chamfer the inside corner, which would give the profile a lighter look. But the, uh, the inch and five eighths is a light enough leg, and I, I decided to leave it on that chair because it felt more in keeping with traditional arts and crafts. But it's not against the rules at all to taper. It's going to give you a little lighter look. You can even tape, put some black tape on there where you're going to take away the taper and stand back. And that will give you, it'll look like negative space, like shadow, and you'll get a, a little sneak peek to what it's going to look like and decide if you like it. What else? Um, what year or period is that chair you were just showing us? Uh, this is early 1800s, probably around 1820. Was Duncan Fife doing his thing? And uh, yeah, it's, it's interesting to see how that derived from French design and what was called the directory uh, period or style out of Europe. Um, but then Duncan Fife had his own own little uh, mastery of that style and popularized it in New York City in that early time frame. There's a, a lot of writing about some other folks that have been valuable influencers. Phil oh, Lowe cool. yeah. and Tage Frid. Am I saying that right? Yeah, Tage Frid, yeah. He, he, was, he did a lot of great uh, work, but more he was known as a great teacher and down at, I think, at the Rhode Island School of Design he was at, yeah. And uh, Norm. Wonderful and Norm. Norm. We love Norm. Who can forget Norm? Nope. And, yeah, Phil Lowe, he actually, I learned a lot from his um, ball and claw video. I learned how to carve ball and claw from Phil Lowe's stuff. So he's still going strong. He's really, he's deep, like, in his... He's like a master uh, classical musician with his 18th century furniture. And Roy Underhill is coming up too. Yeah, Roy Underhill. He's, he's, he likes more the primitive tool methods, but he's, he's sunk his teeth into a lot of furniture for sure. Um, oh, I've got, look, I've got my phone. I can look at some of the questions. Do you, do you have your Wallace Nutting book out? Did you mention that one? Oh, yeah, I, I mentioned it in the description. I didn't bring it out. Yeah, the, okay. the Wallace Nutting series, it's a three-volume, actually two-volume, but it's, that's an awesome, that's another thing Pug and I devoured down there. I should reference that in the notes, but, yeah, I didn't bring those out. But that's a classic, Wallace Nutting. He was obsessed with antiques and, and cataloging them. Really, really well done. And uh, I'm just going to take a little moment to have a minor commercial here. But if you guys are near any place that is asking for filters for medical personnel, and you have, uh, we had a couple of emails from folks who are asking for unopened boxes of filters that might be used, I guess, in. What do you mean by filters? Masks? Uh, masks. And yes, the N95s? I'm, I'm going to use the poor language. Maybe, John, if you could write to me again what exactly I should be saying here. Um, that if you have an opportunity, you have clean ones that are new, and you can share with the community of medical personnel out there. We just want to vote yes on that, personally, and uh, get the word out that that's an important need right now. Yeah. Maybe John can tell me more clearly in the, in the uh, chat what it is that we need. Um, so, is there a contemporary designer that you recommend looking at? Oof. A contemporary designer, she said. Um, well, I think I would look at the Furniture Masters site. Um, I think Tim Coleman's great. Um, Ted Blatchley has influenced my stuff a lot. You'll see from looking at the furniture history that people fall into, you'll just, you'll resonate with certain 
styles. Like some people really get into the honest, direct, linear qualities of craftsman style furniture. If you're more a curvy linear guy, you're gonna, you'll probably enjoy, um, you know, Queen Anne or putting in French curved legs. I probably, I, I like exploring that as well myself. Um, so, I don't know, there's, I would look through the Furniture Masters and kind of, rather than me saying one person, they're going to have their own style and give you one sort of main, you know, a pocket of, of way of working. I would look across like the Furniture Masters, you're going to see an entire uh, menu of different stylistic preferences. So, you can go to a place like that and, and decide what resonates with you. So, I love Art Deco. I think when I was, what really resonated with me early on was um, seeing Sam Maloof's work and James Krenoff's. But there's something about the sculptural beauty of Sam Maloof's work and his iconic rocking chair. And, and I always also love Shaker furniture. And now what's really big is the Danish modern. And I've discovered through this Hans Wegner. If you look up Hans Wegner, he was, a, I've mentioned him before about just a prolific designer of chairs. I think it was over, it's either three or 500 chairs he designed in his, his lifetime. Uh, really magnificent designer. But I realized from reading, I, I thought he actually influenced these guys. So um, James Krenoff, but um, Sam Maloof, and then consequently, guys, in, older guys in the furniture masters like Jerry Osgood, then Ted Blatchley. And you know what's crazy? You know who influenced Hans Wegner and the Danish makers? Were the Shakers. So the Shakers, with their linear restraint and minimalism, actually had a profound influence to the Danish modern movement. Which, and if you think about it and look at that Danish modern, it's very sleek and linear and clean and minimalist. And then, and then Malouf takes that Wagner style. So some of his early stuff is very, almost direct copy of Danish modern. And then he starts to find his own voice and write his own songs. And he comes up with this. So that's where, at first, you're like a woodworker reproducing the great works of history. That's a great place to start. It's like doing cover songs, right? But then, if you stick in there and break through long enough, you could be writing your own songs that are massive hits. Who knows? But you know what? It doesn't have to be a massive hit. And it's never, never too late to get into this. I don't care how old you are. You're, you're stirring with something. So you, you don't have, it's just going to be great, at least in your family. And if you put your heart and soul and love into it, you're going to have a masterpiece. And you'll grow as you move along. Awesome. How, yeah, we could have the next James Krenov listening to this right now. Isn't that cool? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, okay, any recommendations for books to learn about wood itself, properties, types, uses, etc.? Oh, um, probably... Well, there is a nice introduction to this. Let me think. I'll put a, I'll put a copy, but one of the great books that everybody refers to is um, Identifying Wood by Bruce Hoadley. Um, he just recently passed away, maybe in the last, maybe a year ago. Um, he talks a lot about wood in there. Um, I think even, uh, I think Chris, Chris Bexford did something on different types of wood. He, he actually studied, I hope I get this right. I don't think he's watching, but if you are, Chris, sorry. Um, <laughs> but he studied uh, forestry and he almost was like a, I think, a, like a ranger. He has that look and that uh, imposing <laughs> sternness. He could do it. But, um, but then he got into woodworking. So he loves wood from, from all angles. And 
I think he wrote a book about the different properties of wood. With the Grain, Craftsman's Guide to Understanding Wood. Yeah, is that his? Yep. Is that, yeah, so that's a, great, that's a great book about understanding wood. But when you get into species, you know, this book that I showed you earlier on woodworking, they have a big section in the front. And I, I remember going through this, and it gets into all these different species. And I, well, that's plywood. Where's the hardwood? But the hardwood section, I mean, look at this. I went through and I was trying to memorize them all. I have all these little highlights of the different properties. And half these woods I've probably never encountered because of where I live and the type of work I was doing. But look at it, they were all highlighted. And this was back in the 80s. But, you know, what you really remember are those, those materials you work with. And what's really beautiful about it, too, is the first time you saw them and smell them, that will etch in your memory forever. So whenever I first cut walnut, I'm back in Pug Shop. Isn't that great? Like, the way, the way smell is attached to your memory. Um, or basswood does the same thing, you know. I think back to Pug Shop. White pine, it goes back even earlier to my days in uh, trade school. I was 13, 14 years old. <laughs> so crazy, but cool. So yeah, I, I'm sure there's a lot of other books out there. Maybe others can recommend. Yeah, there is a lot of recommending going on. Oh, good. I just want to highlight that we don't know all of them. And so no, if we don't mention all. something here, it's certainly not a nix on somebody that doesn't have quality something to say. Yeah. So it is a tremendous resource in our group right here so there has been suggestion that there needs to be a Tom McLaughlin book in the future yeah well there it is I should just um, I don't know transcribe but, um, these gigs and then sharpen them up they're almost like very rough drafts so back to the filters I just want to say this out loud in case people missed it on the chat 3M half face mask filters um, great for placing breathing tubes, which is a high virus exposure. So, wow. thanks, John, for that. Um, yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. So, are there any other questions? Any other questions? Yeah, there, there's just a lot of mentioning of other places. Lost Art Press, um, yeah. Nakashima's Life of the Tree, which yeah. I know you love. Soul, Soul of a Tree. Soul of a Tree, Sorry. yep. Um, yeah, Lost Art Press has a lot of great historical books. I love their stuff, too. Um, there's a number of authors I'm, I'm skipping. I just grabbed a few of the highlights, but it's great to have this community of resources and recommendation and just to pick the pearls of our experience. And um, Anyway, I, tonight was a little different. We didn't actually physically make any noise or it does and uh but i really enjoyed it I, it's nice to step back sometimes and almost like smoke a pipe and think about the beauty the value and the meaning to why we do what we do so i hope you will continue this journey with me as we bring forth uh we we're woodworkers together but we also uh, bring out the artists in each one of us in our studios. <laughs> but <laughs> Ron's asking, who is your favorite woodworker or mentor? And, and somebody else had asked, who do you follow on Instagram? I mean, clearly Mr. Moore. Yeah, you can go on my um, Instagram and just click on, my fo on who I'm following. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of great people on there. Um, there's too many to mention. I've got, you know, it's over. Because you're so Instagram savvy, aren't you? Tom? I am. I'm just so social media. <laughs> I'm pretty bad with that. But my, what I'm trying to do better with mainly is YouTube and, and this, this little live group. So, well, I hope you enjoyed tonight just stepping back and sitting in the, in the easy chair and have a little conversation about woodworking and, the, and what really enlivens us about being involved in this awesome craft. So 
Till next time from the shop here in Canterbury, New Hampshire, I'll see you on Saturday morning at 10 a.m. Eastern, and we'll continue with our shaker end table with the drawer class. So I'll see you then. Thanks for hanging out with me tonight on Shop Night Live. <laughs> Good night, everybody. Thanks for joining us. All the kind things you're saying. <laughs>